those that are visiting, we've been studying the book of Luke. Last week, we almost got to the end of chapter 19, and we left off at the very end of what's called the journey section, Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And so today, we're going to be focusing in on Jesus coming into Jerusalem and coming to the temple. And so this is, of course, the next couple of chapters is called the temple section. Now, just to give you a little bit of background right here, you might be turning on over to the end of chapter 19. Um, by this time, the temple there in Jerusalem was one of the most beautiful and spectacular buildings in all the world. Um, back, of course, it was the original temple with Solomon that was, so to speak, baptized in gold. It was gorgeous in its day, but 400 years later, it's obliterated by Nebuchadnezzar. Well, then many years later, it's rebuilt by Zerubbabel in about 516 B.C. But, of course, that uh, temple was, so to speak, a, a remnant temple. It was just built with a bunch of poor Jews coming back to Jerusalem, kind of like all of us. Amen, guys? Yeah. Well, over time, of course, in Jesus' time, uh, King Herod ruled, and he had a great vision for the temple. As a matter of fact, it was a 30-year project of renovating the temple, and he wanted to enlarge it. It was literally a quarter of a mile square. Uh, he had the outside done in gold and silver and white marble. It was in the very center of Jerusalem. It was, of course, Jerusalem's on the top of a mountain itself. And so this was, so to speak, one of the most gorgeous buildings, and it represented the people of God's relationship with God. And certainly through the ages, whatever the condition of the temple was, was, so to speak, where the people of God were. So if the temple was totally demolished, then, of course, the relationship with God was, of course, totally gone. So with that background now, let's get in to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 45. The title of the lesson today is Cleansing the Temple. Then Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders amongst the people were trying to kill him. Yet they couldn't find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Well, of course, we remember the detailing of the cleansing of the temple and some of the other gospels where Jesus literally overturned the table of the money changers, drove out the cattle, and of course, all the disciples are hanging around. They can only think of one scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. Right here, Luke wants us to focus in on the spiritual condition of the people of God. And so Jesus actually says, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. And the other gospel writers record that. And one would think, since Luke is the, so to speak, the gospel to the Gentiles, he of all people would want to write to all nations. And yet right here, his focus is really letting us know what Jesus thinks of the Jewish nation. And so then Jesus quotes, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, for a lot of us that don't know the Old Testament, we go, well, den of robbers, that sounds terrible. But for the Jew that understood the scriptures, when Jesus or any prophet would use a section of scripture, he would understand what came before that scripture and after that scripture. So that made them understand what Jesus thought of the Jewish nation. Well, that scripture comes from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11. Let's turn to Jeremiah 7. Let's see what Jesus was saying about the temple. Remember, we're going to read a little bit before and a little bit after. So we understand what was going on. Verse 1, chapter 7. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim the message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. See, right here, even at this time in Jeremiah's time, which would be the early 600 B.C.'s, the temple was still standing and so the people were going, hey, look at the temple. We're in the temple, Lord. We're doing just fine with God. Okay, keep reading. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, 
if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal and other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house which bears my name and say, we are safe. Safe to do all these detestable things? Has my house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. Go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. Right here, Jesus lays it out. Amen, guys? <clears throat> By referencing this scripture here in Jeremiah, we now understand being a den of robbers includes adultery, murder, perjury, worship of false gods. I mean, Jesus lays it out. Now, of course, getting back to our text, we understand that he comes on in here and he clears out the temple, wanting the temple to have a pure worship to God. It was to be a house of prayer. What's the concept of prayer? It's a personal relationship with God. Now, if we really get the full impact, excuse me. <clears throat> if we really get the full impact of this particular passage, we need to understand that in the New Testament, the temple is used two different ways. Turn to 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 3, in verse 16, Paul writes, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. So, Paul talks to the church as being, so to speak, the temple of God. Now go to chapter 6. Verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. All the sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen, guys? Amen. And so, as we approach our study today, Jesus is going to be dealing with the outward temple that led the people in that day to say, oh, look at, we have a great relationship with God. Look at all the gold and the silver and the beautiful marble outward form of the temple. But Jesus is saying, hey, that counts for nothing. It's really what's on the inside that counts. And that's true with all of us. We can say, oh, we go to the right church with the right doctrine. Let me tell you something. That will not save you. You can come to all the church services. That will not save you. You have got to have a personal relationship with God. Are you with me right here? Yeah. Now, let's get into chapter 20. Thank you. <laughs> this week, Elena's been gone, so uh, I've had to doctor myself up this week, so I've not done too good a job. <laughs> but she comes home tonight. I had to clear the temple of my house early this morning. There were a lot of dishes and things because I, I, I knew the Lord was coming back for judgment. <clears throat> I think I'm going to be okay. <clears throat> now, this whole idea, Jesus has cleared the temple. Now this is what he teaches. Verse 1, chapter 20. One day as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us by what authority you're doing all these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He says, who are you to think? You can go in to the temple and clear it out and preach this kind of message to us. Who do you think you are? He replied, well, I'll ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism. Was it from heaven or from men? They discussed amongst themselves and said, well, if we say from heaven, he'll ask, well, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they're persuaded that John was a prophet. 
So they answered, well, we don't know where, where it came from. Jesus said, well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. <laughs> now, actually, a lot of people think that Jesus was just trying to get out of answering the question. Not so. So we're going to see a parable right after this that definitively answers the question. In fact, what you see right here is that Jesus is raising the stakes. They're asking, hey, dude, by what authority are you doing these things? He says, listen, John the Baptist, was he from God or from man? That's a very serious question. Was he from God or from man? If he's from man, it's just another religion, then there's really no authority. It's worthless. It's false. But if John the Baptist were from God, then Jesus is from God. Then his message is from God. And the people stand condemned. You know, in some ways we think, oh man, you know, we, here we are in America, a Christian nation. Well, that's a very loose application to that. But bottom line, we've got to really answer for ourselves. Was Jesus really from God? If he is from God, then the things that he says to us, the things that he says to our church through the scriptures, this is God speaking. And we would do well to pay attention. Amen, guys? Amen. See, we need to understand, is our church really from God? Is the life that we're living really from God? Or are we just going through the motions? Well, Let's go on down now to the parable that he teaches right after this question. By what authority do you do these things? <clears throat> Verse 9. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to the farmers, and went away for a long time. <clears throat> At the harvest time, he sent servants to tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I'll send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they'll respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and kill him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, well, may this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and said, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. Now, the parable right here is really getting back to the authority question, who is Jesus? And a question we got to ask ourselves, are we in a man-made religion or are we in a God-made religion? Now, the parable at first seems simplistic, but it's a little bit more complicated. The vineyard represents Israel. Of course, uh, the owner itself is God. And the tenants, though, are not... not not the people of Israel, but they are the leaders of Israel. They're the ones that are supposed to take care of the vineyards. And we know that for a fact because at the very end, in verse 19, the teacher's law and the chief priests, they knew that this parable was gunning for them. See, Jesus preached at people. And, of course, the servants that came to deliver the message to the tenants were, of course, the prophets. They come. And they're rejected. Finally, God sends his son, his only son. But they kill him too. And Jesus makes that point. And of course, they in their hearts knew that they wanted to kill Jesus. And I'm sure a lot of the people knew that the leadership of the Jews was against what Jesus was teaching. And very seriously and actively trying to do away with his influence. But Jesus makes the point, what then will the owner of the vineyard... <coughs> do to them. He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So these leaders were supposed to have the vineyard, the inheritance of God, and Jesus says, hey, 
No, 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 no. If they do not follow me, they will not get the inheritance. It'll be given to others. And, of course, that is the concept of the Gentiles that come right, right there. Now, in verse 17, he looks at them. He says, then what's the meaning it's written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Well, the stone that he's referring to is himself. The Jewish leaders rejected him, <coughs> but God has made him the capstone. This is different than the cornerstone. The capstone is the stone that's placed on the top of an architectural structure that holds the building together by pressure and is supposed to be quite beautiful. And, of course, he's saying, hey, the stone they discarded has now become the beautiful, kind of the crowning glory of the very building, the temple of God itself. And he says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he whom it falls will be crushed. He says, you have two responses to me. Either you can fall on me by your own decision and be broken and be humble, or I'm going to come on you and crush you. And the same events orchestrate the same thing. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 says, Endure all hardship as they are disciplines of God. You know, all of us go through hardships, don't we? <clears throat> but it's how you deal with them that's going to make a difference with your faith. See, Hebrews 12 makes it very definitive. Is that every hardship we have, God either makes happen or he allows it to happen. God is sovereign. Now, if he's sovereign, then there's a purpose behind the hardship. Are you with me right here? You know, I really want to lift up a couple of the, the bro sisters here. First of all, I want to lift up uh, Ken Zindler. I mean, he's been doing a great job with the adults in the West. And he and, he and Liliana have come out here to California at great personal cost. And uh, he just gave himself freely. And then it came time. He says, you know something? It's time for me to get a job. And he landed this galactic job that was going to make all kinds of money. But then the guy that he was in business with dealt with him dishonestly. And the job was taken away. Now, at first, Ken was really down and maybe even edged towards a little bitterness right there. But, you know, we had a talk. I said, you know something, Ken? There's a purpose behind this. And he, he just perked up and he goes, you know something? I think I may know what it is. This job was so all-consuming. And it was going to take me away from God. And so God brought this hardship on me, not to make my life hard, but to make my life fruitful. Are you with me right here, guys? I'm really proud of Linda Marino right here. Lin Linda and, and Raul just moved here from Santiago, Chile. And right in the midst of that move, she found out that her baby sister had uterine cancer. And you know the hit all of us have when someone in our family has a, a, a terrible disease or something like that, and particularly a, a younger sibling. I was so proud of Linda. She didn't even flinch. She goes, you know something? I know why she has cancer. It's to humble my sister, crush, <laughs> so that my sister will need me and I can go and share my faith with her. And so she has. You know, these are lessons that you've got to learn. And when you understand the principle of the stone that the builders rejected is the capstone. It's really a beautiful stone for the temple then you understand how you've got to react to Jesus. Either you throw yourself on him and you're broken, or it comes down on you and you are crushed. I remember God taught me this early on. I became a Christian at the end of my freshman year in college. And, and I was fired up to be a disciple. I went home, and nobody in my family was fired up at all. As a matter of fact, my, my brother, just a year and a half younger than me, he became my chief persecutor that summer. Randy was, in his mind, an agnostic. And it was, it was a rough summer, you know. Uh, nine months later, he gets cancer. Hodgkin's disease. 
I was at the hospital every day. I was buying him tapes. I brought him a Bible. And he started reading it. Six months later, I baptized Randy into Christ. Now, how about it when, when sickness or a terrible, even perhaps terminal illness hits your family? Do you see the hand of God crushing that person? Or do you see an opportunity for that person to be broken and turn to God? Now, I also have a little sister. She's 10 years younger than me. And so we really weren't very close. I mean, she was seven years old when I headed off to college. And when I became a Christian, you know, she was, she was pretty young, didn't really fully understand everything. But as the years went by, she'd always go to church with me if I asked her when I came home. But there was no response. She became a college student, no response. She got married, no response. She had a kid, no response. She got a terrible divorce, no response. Had numerous relationships, no response. My parents asked me to do the funeral for my grandpa, who we were all very close to. That's, that's a very difficult thing to do. And my grandpa was an atheist. And I just spoke at the funeral. If grandpa would come up from the dead, what would he say to all of us? And I said, deal with God. At, after the funeral, I got in a talk with Dana. We started talking. We just had an incredible talk. A week later, she was baptized and her new husband was baptized. That's 16 years later. See, when, when, when we come to really believe in the sovereignty of God, that we're not in some man-made religion, we're in God's church, that the Holy Spirit really does live inside of us to confirm our relationship, and that all the events that come upon us Yes, the hardest of hardships are not meant to hurt you, but to humble you so that you can bring salvation to others. Amen, guys? Amen. You see, with the temple, you got to clean it out to be devout. You've got to drive out any sense that you're in a man-made religion. Let's get to our next part of the text. Verse 20. keeping a close watch on him. They sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and the authority of the governor. Now, you know, when I read that passage, I thought back to an instant about 10 years ago. Uh, this passage, of course, is Luke 20, 20. Well, about 10 years ago, we had this television report on us this quote-unquote expose by 2020. It's a television show. And what they did is they, they, they wanted to see what our secret practices were. <laughs> so they sent spies on in, pretending to be honest. And I'll never forget on TV, they showed one of our sisters doing the light and darkness study with someone. And, and the sister just shared her heart, all of her past sins, and then the other person kind of coughed up what we came to understand is false things. But I go, you know something? <clears throat> That's okay. Nothing we do is secret. No, nothing we do is shameful. Let everybody know. Let everybody know our sin. Let everybody know our shortcoming. All we're striving to do is to be disciples of Jesus Christ. But what it really said to me is that when you're a real disciple of Jesus, the things that happen to Jesus are going to happen to you. And one of the things that I think you've got to consider, was when was the last time you were persecuted for your faith? If you're not persecuted for your faith, you're not taking a stand. The stand of Jesus is an aggressive stand that says the religion of this world is false. The religion of this world is worthless. And bottom line, does not connect us to God. Now, let's get back to the text here. Let's take a running start. Verse 20 again. <clears throat> Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and the authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God 
in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? When he saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius. Huh. <clears throat> Whose portrait and inscription on it? Caesar's, they reply. He said to them, then give to Caesar what's Caesar and the God what's God. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. <laughs> See, no one, no one could uh, oppose Jesus. He silenced all his critics. They may have hated him. They may have wanted to kill him. But daggone it, they couldn't trap him. He was the truth in human form. You know, right here, I think sometimes we look at this passage, and we don't get some of the creative genius that, that, that Jesus had. They're trying to trap Jesus right here from his following. Believe it or not, Jesus had these huge crowds, and part of the crowd were what we call nationalists. These were people that wanted to get rid of the Romans. But others were Romans, at least Roman sympathizers, and they wanted to trap him by saying, oh, don't pay taxes. And so they asked the question, well, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And it's very interesting. Jesus, I'm sure, could have either made a coin out of thin air like the one he got from a fish. But he doesn't do that. He asked for someone in the crowd, hey, anybody got a coin? I got one. <laughs> well, give it to me. He says, so, whose who's, who's picture you see on this? Well, Caesar's. What's the inscription say? And the coins of that day would have read something to the effect, Caesar Tiberius, son of Augustus the Divine. And some of the more, quote, super spiritual people would have said, well, look, you're, you're, you, got, you have this money, and it says that Caesar's divine. So you agree with that. Well, Jesus' point was, hey, you're criticizing me, but you use this money freely. You're hypocritical. You know full well what to do with taxes. To Caesar, you render under Caesar, and to God, God. Now, sometimes people mistakenly then think that religion should be compartmentalized. And for many people, they think, well, I've got my religion, my, my Christianity on Sunday, uh, 10 to 12. And, and then I've got my real life happening uh, in the afternoon on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No, no, no. For the disciple, Christianity is not compartmentalized at all. Jesus says, if any man would come after me, he must take up his cross daily and follow me. Being a true Christian, being a disciple of Jesus is a 24-7, seven-day-a-week thing. Are you with me right here? Now, we just talked about money. At the very end, Jesus contrasts the leaders of the Jews with someone that has the real heart for God. At the end of chapter 20, we're reading verse 45, these words. While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses for a show and make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Right here he lays it out about the Jewish leaders, amen? They're just taking the money from the temple and they're living lavish lives. Verse 1, chapter 21. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts in the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said. This poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. <clears throat> right here, <clears throat> there is no compartmentalizing of Christianity. It is, you either give up everything, or you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. You know, I'm really inspired by the congregation here, and the examples of so many of you that truly have given up everything. I kind of heard for the grapevine that uh, one of the sisters that just recently moved down here, Margarita, hates Los Angeles. <clears throat> I mean... All the cars, all the expenses of living down here in L.A., and missing beautiful green Portland. 
But why is she here? Because she loves Los No, she hates Los Angeles. <laughs> she's here because she's given everything to Jesus, and she wants to be in a church where she can get her spiritual needs met as well as win as many people as possible. You know, I think about uh, Mike Underhill, our youth minister. You know, I, I, you know, I think about Margarita. She gave up everything to be down here. Mike, when we came on down here, Mike was a fallen away disciple. He was a bartender, living a bartender's life, and living with his girlfriend. When, when we came on down, he was not going, oh, it's so awesome to see you guys. No. We had to drag him to church. But you know, when he started understanding what a relationship with God was all about, he got by all the bitternesses that caused him to fall away. And he understood that God had forgiven him so much more than the people who had hurt him and embittered him and made him leave not just the church, but God. See, Mike understood. He had to give up everything. He had to get rid of that job. That job was taking him away from God. How radical are you? You know, <clears throat> I, I think about uh, our dear brother, Alan Austin. Alan, Alan uh, I mean, here, here he is, a denominational preacher. He comes and studies the Bible and goes, man, this is what the Bible teaches about salvation. But that means I've got to give up my church. And go by the truth. Give up the people that he knew the best. You know, the Bible is quite clear. When you're looking for a place to worship, you've got to figure out, first of all, what is right. Then you can figure out who is right. And Alan came to a deep conviction. I've got to give up everything I knew, no, for my tradition in order to follow Jesus. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm super inspired by a lot of people have moved on in, like the Antalans and the Williamsons. And uh, I'm fired up because I see them really growing and really understanding what it means to give up everything. Tony and Therese in, in, in Portland, they lived in one of the most cranking houses I've ever seen. It was beautiful. They, they, they fixed it all up. It was, it was amazing. And yet, and yet in coming down here, they said, you know something, we need to downsize our lives because we want to give more to the church. And this is not what we're living for, is a giant, giant house. What we're living for is to build God's house, is to build God's temple. I appreciate the Williamson, same thing. They, they had a lovely house up in, in Portland. They've come on down here, and now they're in a two-bedroom apartment. Why? They wanted to downsize so they could start training for the ministry. I've got to ask you a question. You understood when you got baptized to give up everything, amen? amen? But are you growing in that conviction, making radical decisions to become more and more like Jesus? You know, this past week, I was very inspired by what I heard from all the men's nights out. Uh, we, we had a very open discussion about our finances and about, you know, keeping our word as far as giving our tithe. And it was awesome. So, some of the feedback was, was a little bit humorous to me in that, from one of the reasons they said, oh, man, we finally did something Wednesday night. I'm talking about the fact that we just got down and dirty about talking where our finances are at. And, you know, a lot of us were very guarded right there because we really don't trust anybody. We feel like people are going to take advantage of us. And there's even a mindset in, in, in many people, well, the church is going to try to take all your money and take advantage of you. See, we understand that we're not in a man-made religion. We understand that you can't compartmentalize religion everything we have everything we are when we become a disciple now belongs to god and we've got to be transparent with our lives and so this next week the sisters will be doing a very similar exercise but bottom line as disciples how about it is that how you feel about your life are you totally transparent even about your finances because you so much want to live for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And so today, I've just got to challenge you. Follow through with your pledge. 
Amen? Let's go to the last point. Jesus cleared out the temple to get rid of man-made religion, to get rid of compartmentalized religion, and then, finally, ignorant religion. Verse 27. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Well, isn't it interesting? We have all these Jewish leaders coming to the Lord and challenging him. Now, I should say this about the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in angels. And the Sadducees only believe that what's called the Torah or the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible were the only scriptures. They did not hold all the rest of the Old Testament as being scriptures from God. So, with that in mind now, let's, let's read this challenge by the Sadducees. Verse 28. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her, and in the same way, seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given a marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given a marriage, and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They're God's children since they're children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead are rise, raised. For he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, for to him all are alive. <coughs> Some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. <coughs> you know, this story, in some ways, is a very tragic one. Seven times, this woman marries, and she dies childless. Kind of like the phrase, life is hard, and then you die. Of course, we understand the Sadducees just made up this story. <clears throat> and we're trying to test Jesus in what's called a Leverite marriage. You can find more detail about it in Deuteronomy chapter 25, but in essence, it says this. Because God wanted each lineage of each tribe and each person in the tribe to be carried on, when a man married and died without uh, a child to carry on the name, then the Bible says that his wife was to marry one of his brothers, and the first child would indeed carry on the first brother's name. Well, of course, in this particular case, <laughs> she goes through all the brothers, and <laughs> they all die without giving her a kid. But interestingly, Jesus says, <clears throat> the people of this age marry and are given a marriage. And then he goes and explains that there is no marriage in heaven. That in fact, people are going to be like the angels. So now this is, this is hitting, this is hitting kind of hard right here, the Sadducees right here. But notice what he quotes. He quotes from not perhaps one of the more famous verses in that day and age, like uh, Daniel 12, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to share in everlasting contempt. He doesn't quote that, but he quotes Exodus chapter 3. Why? They believe that scripture. And I know you know this. The Bible says that the angel of God spoke from the burning bush. So even their own, quote, scriptures testified in angels. And then the angel said, as Jesus quoted right here, he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but the living, for to him all are alive. And using, quote, their own scripture, he proved to them resurrection. He proved to them Angels, and bottom line, he challenged them about their faith. Turn over to Matthew 
Chapter 22. Yeah. <clears throat> In the parallel passage, We'll pick it up in verse 27. He's telling the story again. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You know, it occurs to me that many of us are in error in our thinking when we do not know the scriptures or the power of God. Now, all the way through the New Testament, there's often the reference to the scriptures. The reference here we share with people is the New Testament and the Old Testament. But the primary reading of this is the Old Testament. Turn with me, please, to 2 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Paul is talking to Timothy, <clears throat> and he says in verse 14, But as for you, Timothy, continue what you've learned and have become convinced of, because you know those whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, now, when he was an infant, there wasn't even the church yet. Now, Verse 16, we share this with all the people we're studying with to become disciples. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That tells me, as disciples of Jesus, we better know, yes, the New Testament, but we need to know the scriptures in a primary reference right here, the Old Testament. Are you with me right here? <clears throat> Number one, <clears throat> we need to understand that we are not simply a New Testament church. We're a Bible church. Yes, all of the covenant has passed, and we now live under a new covenant. But the commands of the scriptures, Paul says, are to be taught, rebuked, corrected, and trained into us. So we need to know the Old Testament. For example, let's talk about salvation. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. In verse 11, in Jesus you were also circumcised in the putting off the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of his sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having canceled the written code with the regulations, that it was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed all the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Right here, you need to understand, if you know your Old Testament, that circumcision was the point in time a person entered the covenant relationship with God under the Old Covenant. Circumcision was simply the removal of the foreskin from the male organ. Now right here, Paul is saying, hey, in the same way, to become a Christian, you must be circumcised, not by the hand of men, but by God, to cut away the sinful life, the sinful nature. And so in this way, you enter a covenant relationship with God by faith that in baptism, you die with Christ and you're raised to a new life. Amen, guys? See, baptism is not just a symbol. That's what a lot of people teach. It's just a symbol. Do it when you have time. At a baptismal service, whatever. No, 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 no. The Bible says this is the point of covenant. It is the point that you enter into a relationship with God. It's the point in time that you die with Christ. You're buried with Christ. And then when you come out of the waters, you're a new creation. 
triumphing all over all of Satan's attempt to condemn you to hell. Amen? Amen? But you need to understand the Old Testament. Secondly, the Old Testament is good for warnings. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Verse 1. Paul says, For I do not want you to be ignorant. Does anybody want to be ignorant in here? Well, Paul doesn't want you to be ignorant either. Okay, so what's it take not to be ignorant? I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate from the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things that they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it's written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. He's saying, listen up. Don't commit immorality or you'll die. Don't grumble or you'll die. Those are serious warnings, amen, guys? You see, we need to know our Old Testament for the sake of warnings and parallels. He says right here, the rock that Moses struck and it gave water. That is likened unto Jesus is our rock. Once more, the analogy of a stone again. That when struck gives us living water. Amen, guys? See, the Old Testament is not a set of happenstance circumstances that just happen in sort of a way that we eventually end up with Jesus. God had a divine plan. It begins to be revealed right here. He says, you, so to speak, were baptized into Moses when they crossed the Red Sea. Well, you got to understand the whole Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities of us living under the new covenant. You see, In Egypt, where there was slavery, that represents our life before we became Christians. Then, going through the Red Sea, that's baptism. Right here, it says you're baptized in the Moses, right? Then, wandering for 40 years in the desert, that's the Christian life. (laughs) See, a lot of people think the promised land is the Christian life. No, the promised land is not the Christian life. It's the desert for you. (laughs) Then they come to the Jordan River, and that's death. We even sing that in our song, Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. You're talking about, I'm going to die. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that. Just go, Jordan River, this is awesome. <laughs> and the song goes, you know, Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. My mother, she'll be awaiting, but she can't help me across. My brother, he'll be waiting. He can't help me across, but Jesus is going to be waiting, and he can help me across. Are you with me right here? So the Jordan represents death. And the promised land, ah, that's heaven, you see. Do you see why you need to know your Bible right here? Well, it's very interesting to me that Jesus confronted the Sadducees that they were in error because they did not know the scriptures, the Old Testament, or the power of God. One thing that... Again, we've wrestled with as a fellowship for a while. Is the vision that we share to evangelize the world in a generation? And though I do not think this is a salvation issue, I do believe the scriptures are plain. Let's start with a few of the scriptures. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew 28, Jesus is talking to 11 faithful apostles. And he says in verse 19, 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus commands the apostles to make disciples of all nations, baptize them. Actually, the reference of baptizing them doesn't refer to disciples. It refers to the nations. He says, after you baptize them, then you got to teach them to obey the scriptures. God damn it. Well, Jesus reiterates this vision in Acts chapter 1. <coughs> Verse 8. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And in fact, that's what the whole story of the book of Acts is about. At the end in chapter 28, Paul gets to Rome, the most influential city of the world, the capital of the world, so to speak. And he comes there and he says, people everywhere are talking against this sect. Now Paul himself records this while he's in Rome in Colossians 1. It's about 60 AD here. Let me read in verse 6. <clears throat> All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Just has been doing amongst you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truths. Like, all over the world, people are getting baptized. Verse 23. This is the gospel that you heard, and it's been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. He says right here, everybody has heard. Now, that doesn't mean everybody became a Christian. Doesn't mean everybody went through the study series, but everybody had heard. How do we verify that? Well, let's go back to another temple scripture back in Matthew. Matthew chapter 24. Remember the beautiful temple, Herod's temple, the gold, the silver, the dazzling marble. <coughs> Verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to these buildings. Do you see all these things, he said? I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, hold it. We know historically, in 70 AD, that that's exactly what happened when Titus ransacked all of Jerusalem and decimated the temple. And now we also know that the temple indeed does represent where the people of God are at. Yes, they were faked out by its outward beauty for a while. This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. We're, we're, we're doing great spiritually. No, you're not, said Jesus. And just to show you, there is going to be a day when not one stone is going to be laid on top of another. The Jewish faith will end. It'll be totally decimated and dead. Now read what he says in verse 9. He's talking to the apostles. And you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Wow, this is the prophecy. Now, if you're hated by all nations, then in order to be hated, someone's got to know you. So all the apostles were known in all the nations. Keep reading. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm in the end will be saved. And get this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world. As a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. And the end he's talking about is 70 AD. If Jesus prophesies the evangelization of all the nations. There isn't a single prophecy Jesus did that didn't come true. See, we need, we need to get a conviction. See, part of our error in not believing this is that we don't really know the scriptures and the power of God. You know, uh, it's been kind of cool. Uh, I, I, last night I, I had dinner uh, date situation, and I came on back, and I kind of wanted to see how the Olympics were going, you know. <laughs> so I... Trying to do my sermon, I flicked on TV a little bit. And it was, I mean, it was, it was pretty amazing. I don't know whether they were running at that particular time, but this 
This one guy, and I love this last name, Bolt. This guy, 6'5", he run this cranking 100 meter, 9.69 seconds, just blew away the field. I mean, he finished it off going like this. You know, I mean, that's how, that's, that's how much better he was. I go, man, that guy cranked. And then, of course, it had the big affair. It had whether or not, you know, Michael Phelps would get the eight gold. I go, good, this is what I've been waiting for, you know. Make a long story short, he got the eight gold. Now think about it. Who of us doesn't know Michael Phelps right now? He flat evangelized us. <laughs> Everyone is her. Now, if Michael Phelps can do that, how about God's church? Oh, you. you know, it has been inspirational to have the Moranos here. And uh, Raul is, is a very fruitful disciple of Jesus. And in Santiago, he baptized many people. But he says, you know, brother, I need to get more training. I go, amen, bro. What, what, what do you need training in? He goes, bro, you know, I feel like I can baptize people, but I, I just don't know how to multiply disciples. Because the Bible says that we got to make a disciple, and then we got to teach them to obey everything that Jesus commanded them. And the last thing to do was to go and make disciples. That's what we're supposed to do. Well, you know, I was so thrilled because... Raul called me up yesterday. He says, bro, I got good news. I go, what's that? He says, bro, this guy that I met, he says, he's going to be baptized. I go, what's his name? It's Raul. <laughs> I go, brother, you're already multiplying yourself. That's awesome. Now there are two Rauls. <laughs> you know, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that what we are doing here is not of man. Oh, we have our weaknesses, we have our shortcomings, and we have our sins. And this is not a perfect church, because you and I are in it. <laughs> but understand quite clearly, God is amongst us. We are the temple of God, along with all the other true disciples that are around the world. Your body is the temple of the living God. If you're a disciple, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And so today, you need to be encouraged that the Spirit of God is in this church, as in your heart, and that indeed, Jesus is working his miracles through people that are less than glorious in the flesh, but are absolutely glorious in the eyes of God because we are indeed the temple of the living God. Now, for some of us, we may be sitting here today and we're not disciples. Then, hey, it's time to make a decision, to clean it out, to be devout. For some of us, we may have had a tough time this week or this past month, maybe this past year, as a disciple of Jesus. It's time to clean it out and be devout. That's what this whole chapter is about. You can cleanse the temple. God will forgive you. And then you too will share in the resurrection. Thank you and God bless.